Okay, so um, we picked, we're going to pick this up where we were last week. Last week we finished up with um, it's, um, Joshua 8, and we finished with verse 20. Um, this is when uh, the initial folks from I came out, or AI came out, and they had looked back and they realized that everything was lost, so they lost, um, they lost all their strength. So verse 21. Now when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. Then the others came out of the city against them, so they were caught in the midst of Israel, some of them on this side and some of them that side. And they struck them down so that they let none of them remain or escape. So I kind of get the idea here that, that once they turned around, they lost all strength at they kind of just stood there. Israel gathered around them, and it was just a, a party to do what God said and, and strike down everybody from, from AI. <clears throat> um, God had the perfect strategy um, at AI. It was um, different than the one he had at Jericho. And the idea here is God has different, different plans for different days, um, and we shouldn't put God in a box. He doesn't work, unif uh, it doesn't work uniformly. Um, his strategies for today, what he wants us to do today, what he wants us to do tomorrow, again, they may be two different things. At the end of the day, God gets to, God gets to be God. Let him direct. It does the body good. And when I said body, I use it in quotes here because it's my physical body, my spiritual body, the church. Um, you know, the church as a whole because we make up, a, we're a smaller piece of the bigger church of um, Christ. Sometimes his instructions are but for but a season, and we need to be open to God's direction for that given season. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. We plant, we harvest, we eat. Um, we have children, or if we have children, we have a time with them, and then hopefully that season changes and they go away um, to other things. It's the way it should be. So, um, ministry is a, a good example, um, how we do things. Um, it's just, there's, there's um, uh, we just need to be open to, to God-inspired changes and in, um, go in whatever direction he's leading us. Verse 23, but the king of Ai they took alive and brought him to Jericho, or to Joshua. And it came to pass, when Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field, in the wilderness where they pursued them, and when they had fallen by the edge of the sword until they were consumed, that all the Israelites returned to Ai and struck it down with the edge of the sword. So the combatants that were up against the Israelites and the army, they came out, they were defeated, and then so what this is, is Joshua and his men basically going back to the city and they're going to finish taking care of the Lord's work by destroying, by destroying the city. Remembering, God had given Joshua the command uh, earlier to stretch out your spear. And this is the start of the combat portion of the engagement. Throughout the engagement, Joshua had a position of eminence from which he gave orders and directed his troops. So I get this idea that he was you know, probably on a mountain or up on a little hill. So when he raised up his sword, everybody knew it was time to, to go and move to come out of, of ambush. If you're in a valley and your, your men couldn't have seen you. This is a reminder to me and maybe to us that Jesus is a type of Christ um, in the Hebrew scriptures. Um, represents Christ on high, and we should be looking to Jesus in the same way, knowing he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And it says this in Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. The life lesson here is faith's ultimate conclusion is victory. Um, is victory for the now and what we're doing now. Um, but ultimately, as we get further through this, um, just like for Israel, because they chose to do it God's way and trusting God, they got to enter the promised land. 
so do we get the opportunity, if we trust Christ, to enter our promised land, which for us will be heaven. Verse 27. Only the livestock and the spoil of that city Israel took as booty for themselves, according to the word of the Lord, which he had commanded Joshua. So, if you guys remember, when they went and took Jericho, they stole some stuff, and the first attempt to take Ai didn't go so well. Um, and the relationship had been broken, so they had to repent. And as that relationship with God had been restored previously, they could count on God to bless them with provision according to the word of the Lord. He had already promised them provision. He had promised them victory. And um, they just got ahead of themselves or decided to do it their own way. And it postponed some things. But ultimately, God said this was going to happen. And ultimately, it did. They, they, they destroyed the city, and they were uh, rewarded with um, um, the booty of, of the, the city. God is so merciful and kind, even in correction. This can be seen in, in this clearly. Um, he didn't hold it against them. As soon as they repented, he said, let's go, let's move. And um, here again, they're, they're rewarded. Hebrews 12:11 says, now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained in it, or trained by it. Moving on to verse 28. So Joshua burned Ai and made it a heap forever, a desolation to this day. And the king of Ai, they, he hanged on a tree until evening. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take the corpse down from the tree, cast it at the entrance of the gate of the city, and raise over it a great heap of stones that remains to this day. So in other um, passages I've read, that the entrance to a, a city like this back then um, sometimes was a place of judgment. You would go there and basically hold court. And um, I think Lot, at one point, they it was surmised that maybe he was part of, of government there because that's where he was hanging out a lot. Um, and that all to say here, it's a, uh, when they heaped all the stones there uh, over the king, it was a reminder um, what the weight of unforgiven sin is. Sin requires a judgment, and as such, AI too had to be destroyed, just as God said. Nothing could remain. Verse 30. So Joshua built an altar to the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, he came in and commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man has wielded an iron tool, and they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. Um, it's interesting that... that and we'll read here in Deuteronomy 27 that Moses had already prophesied, the, you know, he'd said, this is what you're going to do. So it was kind of prophetic commands that he had given um, because it was a done deal, even in Deuteronomy. Um, and what's interesting, too, is, you know, they're offering peace offerings, and it says later on that they were eating and, and making merry there. So when you're in a right relationship with God, you can go to the altar do your sacrificing, be forgiven, and it's not a scary place. Deuteronomy 27, 4 through 7. And again, this is what Moses said needed to happen when they crossed into, into the land of Canaan, or over the Jordan. Therefore, it shall be, when you have crossed over the Jordan, that on Mount Ebal you shall set up these stones which I command you today. And you shall whitewash them with lime, and there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall not use an iron tool on them. You shall build with whole stones the altar of the Lord your God and offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. <clears throat> you shall offer peace offerings and shall eat there and rejoice before the Lord. So I got a little bit ahead of myself, but there's a verse there that, you know, it's an altar. Sacrifice has to be made there, which isn't necessarily a cool thing. Something's got to die. But once that happens, um, again, you're in right standing with God, and they were able to eat there in comfort, and it was a joyful time. 
Um, Ebal, Mount Ebal represents sin and cursing for not following the law. It is fitting for Joshua to have built the altar on Mount Ebal. So um, he could have built it on Gerizim or Ebal. Gerizim represents blessings, Ebal cursings. The altar is where sacrifices are made to cover sin. So how fitting to put it over the Mount Ebal, which is, a, again, a representation of, of, of uh, sin and cursing. A blood sacrifice was the only way to overturn the curse of the law by becoming a covering for sin. <clears throat> it's interesting that that's the case because the altar is uh, prefigured by our Lord Jesus. The altar was the meeting place between God and man, just like Jesus is now the meeting place between us and himself. <clears throat> God was teaching his people a solemn reality. There can be no communion with God and fallen man except by the shedding of blood. Jesus is the sole meeting place or our altar between God and guilty sinners. Acts 4.12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no name under heaven given among men by which we may be saved. So another thing of, of interest here is so Joshua is gathering stones to make this altar and the only time we've seen stones up until this point, we saw them hurling stones at Achan. We saw them hurling stones at the king of Ai. Here, they're gathering stones not to be thrown in judgment, but to build an altar on which sacrifices could be offered for sinners themselves. <clears throat> the unpolished stones, which it, it, it just doesn't say go grab rocks, right? It says unpolished stones, whole stones, uh, show the humility and the perfection of the Savior as he appeared respect, respectively to man and God. So um, the altar is not necessarily all about, oh, it's pretty, oh, it's a nice place to go. It's just they're, they're grabbing rocks that man hasn't chiseled out. There's none of us on the altar. It's go grab rocks, put them there. It's God's thing. And what's interesting about that is Isaiah 53, 2 says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground, he has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So this verse is saying, and I've heard it in other um, teachings that I've been a part of, that um, if you looked at Jesus, you probably wouldn't say, I'm following him because he's a good-looking fella, he's muscular. I mean, I don't know what he looked like, but Isaiah says, not so good, right? Um, so we're not following him for what he is necessarily, but for who he is. He's God's son. Nobody is redeemed by the curse of the law. Jesus became a curse for us, thereby redeeming us through his ultimate sacrifice on the cross. This is um, explained or expressed in Galatians 3, 10 through 14. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law, to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So this is saying, you know, we're getting, you know, we're going to follow by faith, um, and our punishment was paid because we were cursed. Law says we broke, we, you know, you break one, you broke them all, so we're, we were cursed. Jesus on the cross becomes our cursing such that if we, we accept him, um, we get the promise of the Holy Spirit, and it's kind of cool, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but it's talking about you know, Abraham and the Gentiles. So as we get to the later um, verses, you'll see it talks about the stranger. Even in the Hebrew Scriptures, the stranger, us, Gentiles, was being thought, thought about. Um, we weren't just an afterthought. It's just like, oh, what do we do with these guys? It was, we, he already had a plan. Also, it mentioned that there was whitewashing. Um, with lime, this is basically just a type of plaster so they could uh, get the stones white in preparation for writing things on them. 
Um, so Joshua was preparing the stones so he could clearly write the words of the law on them. In a similar way, our hearts are to be whitewashed in preparation for God's word being written in our hearts. Um, I like to think that, that when we come to Christ, um, we're all full of junk and garbage, and immediately we say, I do, and we're white. We don't know everything at that point, but now we start our journey, and that journey should have us reading the word, hanging out with brothers, sisters in Christ, and all that stuff is going to put an impression on our heart, and we have that, then we can, we can uh, take that and share that. Be the hands and feet, as it were. So there, and then verse 32, and there in the presence of the children of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. Then all Israel, with their elders and officers and judges, stood on either side of the ark before the priests, the Levites, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the stranger, there's the word stranger, as well as he was born among them. Half of them were in uh, front of Mount Gerizim, and half of them were in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. So we'll see here in a little bit, they also split the tribes of Israel. They have part of the tribes from Abraham's handmaidens on one side, and then from uh, Rebekah and Rachel on the other side, intermixed in all that are the... Um, again, are the, the strangers who represent Gentiles when we talk through um, the Hebrew Scriptures. So here's some more prophetic commands uh, from Moses. Deuteronomy 27, 8, and then 12 and 14. And you shall write very plainly on the stones all the words of this law. These shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you have crossed over the Jordan. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph ben, and Benjamin, and these shall stand on Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulon, Dan, and Naphtali. So then, Jesus, uh, so then Joseph writes, um, writes on these stones a copy of, of um, the law um, to memorialize God's word to his people, uh, to make it a visual uh, thing. Um, sometimes you can hear things and it may or may not click. You see things, there's a better opportunity for it to click. Um, there's another reason we'll get to here, too, why I think he did it. Um, but all of this is to force um, God's holy claim upon the entire body of, of Israel there. 2 Corinthians 2, I'm sorry, 3, 2 through 3. Um, and we were talking earlier about our hearts instead of stones um, being written on our hearts. It says, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. A life lesson, the best way to remember God's mercies is not to forget his law. Um, So we can be forgiven um, for anything that we break in the law, because we will. Not a purpose, but going to happen. At least it does for me, maybe not you guys. But what, what the cool thing is here is um, we get to go to God and ask for forgiveness, but while we're doing that, we can remember what the law actually does if there's no Jesus. In front of the law, we're all guilty going to remain guilty, going to be guilty forever, no ifs, ands, or buts, we're not going to pass go, we're not going to collect our $200. <clears throat> so, um, as you are made aware of that and think on that, you know, it can have some meaning to you. And that's why sometimes you, you talk to folks that have been involved in different things that we just think, oh, that's just egregious. Those folks have been forgiven a ton, and often those 
folks are the ones that are most um, joyful and most um, thankful um, because they know what they were before they weren't. If that makes sense. So again, we mentioned Mount Ebal represents cursings uh, because of disobedience. And um, that's where the cursings are going to be read because we're going to have some tribes on this side, some tribes on this side, and they're basically going to be speaking at each other in unison um, back and forth. So we've got, we've got the um, curses being lobbed from Mount Ebal, and um, that's the side where, again, the, the children from the handmaidens are, and then from Mount Gerizim, they're going to be hurling blessings over um, because they followed the path of, of obedience. Um, the good thing is, is here, probably when, when Abraham was promised a son, the idea was not go find somebody else to have that child with. It was, there's your wife. He couldn't wait. She couldn't wait. Um, but the cool thing is, all of them are here. They're segregated on, on different sides, but they're all going to be part of, of the, the blessing. And so what is occurring in this verse is a ratification and recovenanting by the new generation of Israel to the covenant and keeping of the law previously entered into by the fathers at Sinai. <clears throat> Just like them um, ratifying and covenanting or recovenanting, Christians too can enter a covenant through Jesus. And when we do, we should be expressing our thankfulness by obeying God's law. I had mentioned last week that, um, uh, that Abraham was, was called an I, or AI, and I was talking to Pastor Tom, so he sent me a, a, uh, a video, uh, not a video message, a um, vocal message, and said, hey, I looked it up, it's not I, it's AI, and I don't know, I thought I, thought I, was, was, I was doing research, and they had a couple of, of scholars that were digging up the city, and they, they were laughing and making fun of people that called it AI. So, of course, I'm like, oh, they are scholars. Obviously, it's I. So, AI, I, I don't know. So, now I've got I in my head. But, <laughs> but that? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but, again, um, this is the verse we said last week. Um, it's in Genesis 12:8, And you move from there to the mountain east of Bethel, he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an offer to the altar to the Lord, and he called on the name of the Lord. So he's already at the place of promise generations and generations earlier. Abraham and descendants uh, are promised in covenant the land of Canaan. Um, and again, as I mentioned, they started out as strangers too. Um, in one of these verses... Uh, this verse I think we're going to read, it even calls Abraham a stranger. So at, at one point, we all start out as strangers to, uh, to God in the spiritual sense. Genesis 17, 7 through 11. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan is an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my commandment, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of a covenant between me and you." So at this point, um, Abraham's going to show a lot of faith because he's 99 and he's going under the knife. So, but the good thing for him is, is this. He's starting to um, find the blessing of God. He's going to follow God. It's going to be evidenced by the fact that he's about to, again, go under the knife for circumcision at age 99. And, it, and of interest here is the blessing and the promises begin after, after the circumcision as a sign of the covenant between Abraham and God. So in, seven, in Genesis 17:1, we see that he's 99 years old when he is circumcised. 
And then if you read ahead in Genesis 21.5, Isaac is born when he's 100. So it's within a year that he gets Isaac, who's the promised son, to be the descendants. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that there's circumcision, a faith act, trusting, and then bam, there's, there's Isaac and the, the, the child of promise, if you will. Joshua would lead Israel into the promised land later, thus fulfilling the promise made to Abraham. But before Israel could enter the promised land, they had to be circumcised, demonstrating they were again in covenant with God. So what happened was in Egypt, circumcised, circumcised, circumcised. They go out to the wilderness, circumcised. They go look at Jericho, not Jericho. Um, uh, they went to, you know, when, when uh, Caleb and J Joshua went to spy on the land of Canaan, they come back, it's like, oh no, we can't do it. Um, at that point, God said, fine, you're going to wander for 40 years. Well, guess what they stopped doing? They stopped circumcising the, the, the kids. So um, Joshua 5, 2 through 5 says, At the time the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives for yourself and circum circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of foreskins. And this is the region... And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt, who were males, all of men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. For all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out had not been circumcised. Um, so again, um, you don't get the promised land without accepting Christ. And again, circumcision is kind of uh, an act to demonstrate where your trust is. And again, um, we keep reading about the stranger. It says, uh, just as a stranger shared in Israel's privileges, so it had to share in their obligations by entering into a covenant with God. So they got to have this act of faith as well. Numbers 15, 5 through 16. One ordinance shall be for you of the assembly and for the stranger who dwells with you, an ordinance forever throughout your generation. As you are, so shall the stranger be before the Lord. One law and one custom shall be for you and for the stranger who dwells with you. And then Exodus 12, 48 and 49. And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and let them, and, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native of the land. For no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born and one for the stranger who dwells among you. Um, this is similar today, right? There's one way. Um, whether you're a Gentile, Jew, Arab, doesn't matter. Um, you get to God through, through Jesus. Um, and it's the same for all of us. Um, and that's what they were demonstrating here. Circumcision is a sign of covenant in the Hebrew Scriptures, similar to the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. We do not have life until we trust Jesus as our Savior. We will receive, an, we will receive no inheritance apart from Him, and the Holy Spirit is a testament of that inheritance. So the good news is, you believe in Jesus, you get to go to heaven, but while we're here, we get the Holy Spirit, which is a pretty cool thing, because that's a little bit of heaven, frankly, inside of us, um, that hopefully, if we listen, will help us as we wander through um, this world that we're passing through. Ephesians 1, 13. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to praise of his glory. And now we're back to Genesis, I'm not Genesis, back to Joshua 8, verse 34. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessings and the cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that, that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel, with the women, the little ones, and the strangers who were living among them. So again, it's everybody's included, nobody's left out. Um, Israel's all there, they're 
shouting back and forth the blessings and the cursings, and they, they're all, they're, they all get to be partakers of, of this. In Deuteronomy 27 and 28, um, that's where all the blessings and cursings are. We're not going to read that, but, but um, they, are, they are all read and are reminded of, of the blessings to follow um, and the curses to follow if they don't follow, um, follow the law. Um, and then notice to Joshua, he's reading every word Moses had commanded him to read. Um, at that point, not a whole lot of the Bible is written, but he's, he's, right, he's reading what he was commanded to do, and it's the whole counsel of God as he had at that point. And um, and that's not a coincidence. Even And so it's... it's underscored even in the New Testament where we have in Matthew 5:18, for assuredly I say to you till heaven and earth pass away one jot or one tittle will not by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled because we know all scripture is inspired and profitable as it says in 2 Timothy 3 16 and 17 all scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine for reproof restruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. So just like they needed to hear it all, we need to hear it all, and this tells us exactly why. Um, we want to be complete. We want to be thoroughly equipped for good works, whatever those good works are. Um, maybe running around here talking to people. It may be in the workplace when, you know, I kind of mentioned last, last week, kind of get the idea sometimes lying in ambush so somebody asks you a question so you can attack them with an answer. Um, but you can only do that um, if you're taking the whole counsel of God and you're equipped and ready to do that and to give an account. Now, once again, the stranger is mentioned in these verses. It's an indication that even in the Hebrew Scriptures, God has anticipated the gathering of the Gentiles to himself through his Son. Um, nothing's left by chance. God had it worked out even before time began, so to speak. He knew what he was going to do. Um, as the law was read to the entire assembly, it is an indication that all are under the law. Um, and being under the law, as I mentioned, is not necessarily uh, a good thing um, because we can't stand up to the law. It, it makes us cower because we're all guilty in front of it. There's only one person who, who can stand and look at the law and not cower, and that's Jesus. Deuteronomy 27, 14 through 15. It informs us as each of the solemn curses of the law were spoken by the Levites with a loud voice, it was required that all the people should answer and say amen, thus concurring with all that was spoken. Matthew Henry points out and says it this way, this is a profession of their faith and acknowledgement of the equity of them and them being the law and what was spoken. They, they're saying, yep, we agree this is fair. Um, and it's also in, uh, imprecation upon themselves, obliging them to have nothing to do with evil practices upon which a curse was entailed. Because again, they're standing on either side of the mountain. One yells a curse, one yells a blessing. What they're saying is, if we do these things, we're going to be cursed. So we don't want to do those things. And then these guys over here are saying blessings. If you do these things, you'll be blessed. And then also, um, when the law is written on these stones at Ebal, it becomes the law of the land. Um, this was um, in part, I think, and we got into this a little bit with Joel's question after. Um, the object of them conquering in Canaan was God wanted a, a people in obedience to him in a country um, that was quite honestly... Um, degenerate, very heathen, and just had a lot of issues. Um, and we talked about, too, some, and I don't know if we know all of them, but not everything got destroyed. Some cities remained um, uh, going forward. And by virtue of having God's people there doing it God's way, they could look and maybe be influenced um, in making better choices uh, uh, for their life. Moses, and then Moses said this, Deuteronomy 4, 
5 through 6. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is wise and understanding. So he's saying they're going to be wise and understanding. I don't know what it goes further to say, but I don't get the idea that I, maybe I'm not going to speak for you guys because maybe you guys are wise in your understanding. I'm not. Can't hit that. Um, so it would be, wow, they're really wise, and maybe they'll ask a question, why are you so wise? And when we had Solomon, right, wisest man ever, people come to him, and he got his wisdom from God. So um, he got an opportunity to tell folks that. And then similarly, we are a testimony in this time. So Jesus was talking to his disciples in Matthew 10, 18, um, and so this is specific to the disciples, but I think we can take this as a word for us as well when he says, you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to the Gentiles. And again, Gentiles just represents an unsaved person. So if you're a Christian and you're wandering around, you're God's testimony um, to those people. So in closing, the children of Israel could not enter the promised land uh, until they had dealt with sin and put their faith and trust in God. Ultimately, they chose to follow God and guess where they got they got to their promised land. If you recall, Abraham was initially a stranger from God, um, and because of sin, we start out as strangers as well. Just like God had a place of promise set aside for Israel, so God has always had a plan for us to be with him in heaven through salvation. John 1.13 says, or Joshua 1.13, I'm sorry, remember the word of Moses the servant, of the Lord commanded you, saying, The Lord your God has given you rest and is giving you this land. Hebrews 4, 1 through 3. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they, which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we know, for we who have believed do enter the rest, and he has said, So I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So what the last verse basically is saying, you got two options. You've got rest, or you don't have rest. You follow me, accept me, you have rest. Because um, that's heaven ultimately is rest. We'll be really busy, um, thankfully. Um, but we'll have glorified bodies, so we'll feel rested all the time. But basically, we're going to enter, enter um, his rest. Sin requires a payment, and a punishment for sin is death, and eternity apart from God. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift to God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus, as our payment, means he paid the price and punishment for our sin, granting us eternity with him in heaven. Okay, so if we realize our sin, repent, accept Jesus, Jesus' payment on the cross, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, and one day we will enter his rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Um, the last life lesson, there used to be a verse, no God, was it? No God, no peace, no God, no peace. Well, I've stolen that, but I've changed it. No Jesus, no rest. No Jesus, no rest. So the question is, you know, what are we going to choose? And this kind of, what was really cool in studying this is, because this is the gospel, right? The gospel was in this chapter in my face. Um, I'm assuming most of us here are, are Christians. If not, we just heard kind of the plan of salvation here. Um, get that right. Maybe it was for YouTube, because we got two cameras going tonight. It's awesome. Um, don't know. Um, and then the other thing we can take out of, of this, too, is if you are a Christian, you can see through um, this path that when they wanted to do it their way in the first attempt to take AI, didn't go so well because there was sin in the camp. They fixed it. They turned, did it the right way, and God blessed their socks off. So... 
um, we're going to be breaking up into uh, small groups. And I had a couple of, of things maybe to ponder as we go to group. And the first one is, um, and it's of number one importance, is what are you doing with Jesus? Uh, second question is, what do, what do you learn from your mistakes and failures? Um, and then how have, and this comes from really the first week, how have you postponed his promises? And then discuss a time when God was merciful to you in correction. And then lastly, this is maybe a little follow-up, although we beat this up pretty good last week. Um, but when, it, when I was reading uh, from Deuteronomy uh, 4, 5, and 6, when it talks about them having to go in to destroy Canaan, first what we don't know is they might have had, and I think we talked about this last week, they may have had, and we know they had, right? Because God's not going to just destroy you and not give you an opportunity. We just don't read about that opportunity. It says the rocks will cry out, right? Um, so ultimately they had to be destroyed, but not every city, as we go through this, we'll see either because Israel was disobedient or they made a deal or whatever. There are some cities, there are some people left. Um, and so I think part of this may be if they don't have an example to look at, what do they learn? So this may be, we're gonna to have to destroy that. We've given them their opportunity. We have these people over here. We're gonna put the children of Israel, they're gonna look and maybe they get another opportunity. I don't know, but it's something to, to discuss.